Amen. I thank God this morning um, to actually be back. Amen. To do my devotions. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing the devotions outside and it was really uh, cold. <laughs> Amen. And I had just gotten over a sinus infection and I got sick again because I was sitting out in the cold. So I had to find a place in the house, amen, that was quiet enough to where I could do the live um, devotion. Amen. And so I had to find something that, um, you know, that you could look at. <laughs> While I was doing devotions, amen. And so I found a picture slideshow that I can put on while uh, doing devotions. And so I thank God for that. And I thank God for his mercy and for how he kept me, amen. And for how, uh, you know, the situation didn't get, you know, out of hand to where I had to go to the doctor, you know, and get antibiotics and stuff like that. I was able to just you know, handle it all right here. And I thank God for that. Amen. Um, I want to just start with prayer, of course, and uh, pick up kind of where we left off. Um, so we'll do that this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, your mercies, which endure forever. Amen. They're new every morning, and we're grateful for that and thankful Without you, we can do nothing of ourselves. It's within you, Father, that we live, move, and have the very essence of our being. You've been so good, merciful, and kind, and we just appreciate you and all the things that you do for us, all the things you're doing for us and will do for us. Amen. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Where we left off, we were talking about the life of Christ, and we were coming out of the gospel of St. John, amen, and um, that we had followed the life of Christ on up until his death, burial, and then resurrection, and um, I just can't shake looking at the life of Christ, amen, for the whole two weeks, I've been reading and rereading John, looking at the life of Jesus Christ and the things that he did, amen, while he was on earth in the days of his flesh. And I got to looking at his life and comparing his life to my life, amen. And we're to be followers of Christ, amen. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, and so I, I began to make a comparison of his life and my life, and I found myself lacking in many ways. Well, it, almost in every way except for the love of the Father, because I love God with all of my heart, um, mind, body, and soul. But as far as doing the things that he did, and I, I looked at his life, and I found that I found that he did a lot of teaching from the scriptures when he was in the synagogue. So when he was in church, he taught from the scriptures. And the scriptures for them was actually the law, amen, that was written by Moses. And so he taught them from the law. That's why he told them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. So he was dealing with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were uh, the rulers or the, or the headship or the leadership of the synagogue, and they knew the law. Amen. And that's why they had a problem with accepting Jesus, because he didn't come the way they thought that he should come. They knew that he was to be born a king. And they know that kings are not born 
in barns. Kings are normally born in castles. <laughs> Amen. And Jesus came lowly being born in a manger. And so I begin to look at the strategy of Jesus. You know, why is it that he didn't come the way man thought that he should come? You know, why is it that he chose to be born in the fashion that he was born in? And I looked at that because, see, Jesus knows the heart of man. And he wanted man to seek him for who he was. And, and he knows that man wouldn't have a problem worshiping a king. Because that's the kind of prestige that man is looking for. And that man operates in. Amen. And so he wanted the heart of man to want him. To seek after him. So it really shouldn't matter how he came as long as he came. And if they really had searched the scriptures and the scriptures were in their heart or they studied the scriptures by the spirit, they would have accepted him for who he was no matter how he was born. And they didn't do that. But I look at the strategy that Jesus used when he came to earth. Amen. And I studied that. And not only that, but when he spoke to the scribes and the Pharisees, he spoke in parables, or he spoke in, 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 um, in such a way that they really would not be able to understand what he was saying. But when he spoke to the disciples, he explained the parables to them. Amen. Just, uh, the life of Christ, that's something that we've got to look at because that's something that we've got to mimic. We have got to mimic the life of Christ. He came to earth in the flesh to show us how to get back to him. That's the whole purpose. How to get back to him. And so we've got to study his life. I urge you, I urge each and every one of you to get in that Bible. It doesn't matter what gospel you read. They all lead to Jesus. I just chose John because he comes from a standpoint of view by love. And I love love. Amen. But Matthew and them, they've got good, good readings on the things that Jesus did from different aspects. And it's good to kind of read all of them because what one misses, another picks up. So you pick up in Matthew where the message that was being taught back then was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that started with John the Baptist. He was the first one that began to teach or preach that message. Jesus picked it up in Matthew when he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the, the difference between the preaching and the teaching, if you notice, the teaching was done in the synagogue amongst, amongst people that knew the scriptures. So in the synagogue or in the church, he taught from the scriptures. He didn't preach. He taught from the scriptures. He started doing that when he was 12 years old. He taught from the scriptures. But when he preached, he preached in the streets. And the message was one and the same. And that was repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And you'll find that throughout Matthew. Because I, I actually read uh, 
in Matthew as well as John, because John doesn't go with what he um, preached. John basically goes with the teachings that he did in the temple. And there's a difference. You know, in the church, you need to be taught the scriptures. But in the streets, in the highways, in the hedges, in the byways, you need to be preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And this bothers my spirit because this is something that I don't see a lot of. I really don't see a lot of us in the street preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. If it was at hand back in the days of Jesus, then it is certainly at hand in this day. That means the kingdom of God is now. It stands before you. And the kingdom of God is the, the way of living that Jesus did. Somebody says, well, what is the kingdom of God? So I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance. And it is, figuratively speaking, it is a, a, a kingdom, a way of living. Amen. Jesus came down here and the reason he was not accepted is because of his lifestyle and his teaching of, of, of love one another. These were commandments that were in the law, that were in the very scriptures that the scribes and Pharisees were supposed to have been reading daily, or the Pharisees for sure, because they were the Jewish religious leaders. And they claimed to love Moses. He said, well, if you love Moses, you will accept me because I'm all Moses ever talked about. And I'm paraphrasing. But I, I want you to get it. And, and we're coming out of the book of St. John and, and, and Matthew. I have it referred to a scripture because I didn't really actually want to, to get in um, to the scripture on today. I just kind of wanted to do a catch-up thing. Amen. But the, the scriptures that I referred to uh, were Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 where St. John says, where um, John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then Jesus picks it up in Matthew 4 and chapter uh, chapter 4 and verse 17 where he says the same thing. And then again in chapter 10 of St. Matthew and verse 7 where he is instructing the disciples to go out. He said, and as you go, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what needs to be preached in the streets. You know what? If we did, I thought about that. And if we did that, people would certainly think that we were crazy. If we started going out into the streets, seeing people at work, in the grocery store, wherever it is that we are, and we start telling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, People are going to look at you like you're crazy. And they're not going to want to be bothered with you. They're going to call you a fanatic. And they're going to say that you're crazy. And the very same thing that happened back in the days of Jesus when he walked in his flesh is going to start happening to you. you're not going to be able to go into the, the streets the way that they did back then and start preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because the police are going to come and they're going to say that you're disturbing the peace or they're going to say that you, you need to do this kind of thing in a church. And you're going to start having the same problems that Jesus had back then. They're going to start persecuting you. Amen. So after I viewed the life of Christ, then I went over into the acts of the apostles because everything that Jesus did in the gospels, 
he prepared his disciples and he told them, they hated me, they're going to hate you. You, you. you can't be more than what I was. And everything that they've done to me, prepare yourselves because they're going to do it to you. And if you go and read the Acts of the Apostles after you read the Gospels, you will find that the Apostles ran into the same things that Jesus ran into. He already told him, he said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my father. And the acts of the apostles after the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one place with one accord and the Holy Ghost fell upon each of them, cloven tongues like as a fire, and they spake in tongues. Then they were empowered by the Holy Ghost to begin to go out and teach the word of God as they had been commissioned. And they started where Jesus left off. They started with his death. And they started talking about how he was crucified and how the crucifixion was unmerited. And this got the officials upset again. And they started coming after the apostles. And you know the story if you've read it. If you haven't read it, read it. Because they were beaten. Some of them were crucified or hung upside down. All kinds of things happened to them. Because of their love for God and of them following in his footsteps. And I look at our life today, my life. Would I be able to stand that type of test? Why is my life in Christ so mundane? Why isn't it that I am not out there doing what Jesus and the apostles did. Where is it that we fall short? Is it because we're operating in unbelief? Or is it because we've just become so, so lackadaisical? Or is it because we just really don't know how we're supposed to, to approach this thing? And if it's because we don't know how to approach it, then we are without excuse. Because Jesus has shown us and Paul has shown us. I, I, I was in church the other morning. And the minister at the end of the service, he gave the altar call. And he said, well... Is everybody in here saved? Because nobody came to the altar. And he said, well, I'm glad that everybody in here is saved. And when he said that, I thought about what he said. We're all in here claiming to be saved, claiming to know Jesus. Was not a sinner among us. Was not nobody among us that needed to be saved. So we're preaching to ourselves. And that thing hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked around and, and the people that I seen were people that I knew were, or were claiming to have a relationship with Christ. Yet there was nobody among us that was in need or that needed to be delivered. Or, or, or that was seeking to know who Jesus was. And that bothered me. What are we doing? What am I doing? Who have I invited to church? 
Who have I spoken to and warned them that the coming of the Lord is soon and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? I, I wanted to pause right there so that you can think about not only what I'm saying, but the reality of what I'm saying. Who are we reaching? There's a psalm that says, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living will not be in vain. Who, who are we helping? If everybody around us is saved, if we've talked to everybody in our family and they're saved, then who are we reaching? Are we done after we've talked to everybody in our family or everybody that's close to us that we know? Are we finished? No, I don't think we are. I, I believe the reason that the Lord said, go back and look at my life is because he wants the church to be on the move. We're to go into the highways and the byways and compel men and women to come into the Lord's house. And that word compel means to literally drag them into the Lord's house. Amen. When we were little and, and, and we were outside playing and it began to rain. And we didn't want to come in the house because we weren't ready to stop playing. And my grandmother would come to the door. And she would say, get in this house. Get in this house. It's raining. Ain't you got sense enough to come in out of the rain? Well, yes, we did. And no, we didn't. We knew we should have come in out of the rain. But we didn't want to because we weren't ready to stop playing. And it wasn't really raining that hard. You know how it, it starts out with a little sprinkle here and a few dots there before the actual downpour comes. We're getting ready to have a downpour. And we're not ready. We're not ready to come in the house out of the rain. And if we're not ready as Christians... Well, what do we expect from the sinners and the and and the ungodly? The scripture says if if we're gonna scarcely make it in, where are they gonna be? This is something that we have got to consider. We've got to consider it. God wants us to. I'm not a preacher. I don't have a platform in the church to get up and say the things that I'm saying. But I have a platform in the social media. I can get on here and I can say these things. Whosoever will can receive it. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. God's coming is soon. And the way has not been prepared. So we've got to go back. We've got to go back and we've got to begin to prepare the way in a better way than what we have been comparing it. I know the scripture says, in business be men. But church is not a business. It's a lifestyle. It is the kingdom of God. It is a better way of living. They were so angry with Jesus because he did not conform to their way of living. He showed them a better way, a more excellent way to live. And they didn't like it. 
A lot of people don't like change, don't want change. And they fight against it. And then they don't want you to change either. They want you to stay the same. So when Jesus began preaching the kingdom of God is at hand and people begin following him, then the established world or the established church world got angry. They didn't want the way that Jesus was talking about. They wanted it the way they wanted it. They wanted to continue to go into the synagogues, read the scriptures, and close the book, and go back business as usual. They weren't really looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. If they were really looking for him, like the astrologers were back then, when they were searching for that star of Bethlehem that would show them where Jesus was uh, going to be born, if they were looking for him diligently like they were, they would have found him in the scriptures, no matter how he came. They would have found him. But they were not looking. They wanted to just keep reading about it and close the book and go on with business as usual. And that is the way some of us are. We don't want to change. We we want to just be just the way we are right now, stagnant. We don't want any more. We want to keep our routine. That's why COVID-19 was such a blow to many of us, self-included, because it messed with our systematic routine. We couldn't systematically continue to do the things that we had done every day, all day, 365 d days of the year. That was one of the things that upset us so bad about covid Yes, it was taking lives, but it was messing with our lifestyle. We've got to get into the Word of God. And we've got to get this thing in us. It's imperative for the, for the sake of the world. I'm hearing people all over the world on different social medias, in different churches that are live. I'm hearing the cry of the people as they are seeking God. And he's showing up in a way to them that they've never had him show up before. And they don't know what to do with it. And my heart goes out to them because I'm saying, go back to the word. Go back to the word. I know I'm not the only one that he's saying, go back to the word. Get your hunger for Christ renewed. He that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Hey man, I, I, I'm not going to hold you long. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and end because I want you to think about what has been said today. I don't know exactly what has been going on in your particular setting within the last two weeks. But within the last two weeks, I, even though I didn't come on live to do devotion, I still did devotion. Please believe me, I still did devotion because that is a way of life for me now. I can't turn back from this. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm about to get radical. I'm about to get myself in a place where people are going to either love me or hate me. Because I'm going to do what God says to. And I'm going to live the life that Jesus lived. 
I'm going to tell people the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'm going to tell whoever will listen. And I'm going to start there. We are in the church. And we're being preached to. And we're being preached at. And our actions are not what they should be. Because our actions do not are not producing. We're not producing. Again, I was in church on Sunday. There was not one person that we could say was a sinner. Or there was not one person that came into the church and said, show me the way, I'm lost, I want to be saved. The whole 25 of us, if there was that many, already had a relationship with God. What did we come to church for? What were we looking for? What are we seeking What do we do with what we receive? Where is the addition to the church? In Acts, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There was a daily addition back in the early church. Where is that addition now? I, you know, just observe, just observe. When you go to your church, if you're able to go to church, and when you go to church, look at the people that are there, that are around you. And most of them, the majority of them, are people that are professing to be saved. And they're coming to church on Sunday morning for the ritual, for the routine, for the order of service. Many of us come to church, we know exactly what's going to happen. Isn't that something that we already know what's going to happen in church before we get there? Because it's the same thing over and over again. It's a routine. It's moldane. We come to church. We go to Sunday school. After Sunday school, there's a brief reprieve. After that brief reprieve, then we go into morning devotion. After that, there's usually an MC that gets up and does an order of service. And in that order, you'll have prayer. You'll have a scripture read. You'll have your announcements. You'll have the choir sing. You'll pick up an offering. The choir may sing again. And then the preacher gets up and preaches. After he preaches, there's the altar call. After the altar call, there's dismissal. And during the dismissal, you're reminded again of all the announcements that have already been read. You're urged to govern yourself accordingly. You dismiss. After church is over, you talk to those you feel more comfortable with or, or more familiar with. You might stand around and talk a little bit after church. And then after that, you go out to dinner or you go home and finish your dinner and you eat, and you go to sleep. Whose life have you touched? Whose life have you touched? Did you go to church and, and leave church feeling renewed and refreshed and, 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 and ready to help somebody along the way? Did you go to church and leave feeling worse than you did when you went? Did you go to church and were you able to shake the feeling that you had before you got there? Or were you worried about your roast cooking while church was going on? Were you even in tune with what the Spirit was saying to the church? These are things that we have to look at. Have we become so systemized that we're just lollygagging through life? like a Neanderthal, doing the same thing over and over again in the same way. 
You're not helping anybody and you're not helping yourself. It is time for us to take a look at ourselves and compare our life to the life of Jesus Christ. And once you do that, I guarantee you, if you are truly seeking God, a change will come in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you're dealing with us in such a way that we've had to come to a place of reality and consider our ways and our doings. In every area of our life that we have found lack, oh God, by reading your word, we can pick up the slack and we can begin today to do the work and the will of the Father the way that we're supposed to. Help us, O oh God, to seek your face. Help us, O oh God, to want to be more like you. Help us, O oh God, to, to mortify the deeds of the flesh and the flesh itself, that our spirit man may grow by the reading of the scriptures and the enlightenment of your word as you illuminate it with life. Oh God, let this become our desire if it's not already. Be with us as we read the scriptures. Be with us, Father, as we embark upon things that we've not embarked upon before, that we've not been touched by before. This awakening that you're creating in your church, let it grow, God. Let your people humble themselves before you. Lord, hear the cry of those that are diligently seeking you. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, we need you as never before. You said in your word a broken and a contrite spirit, you would in no wise despise. You said in your word, if we seek, we would find. If we knocked, the door would be open. And if we ask in your name, it would be given. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge of that and the understanding of that. And help us to operate in that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen again. Amen. I thank God again this morning for <clears throat> finding a way to be able to come back on where I'm in the house where it's warm and I don't have to sit on the back porch or out in the car. Amen. I think I started that because the weather was nice. Amen. When we started. But of course now um, it's turning cold and we're not able to do that anymore and I'm going to try to fix this so that it's a little better so um, be patient with me but it's not about <laughs> it's not about any of what you're seeing but it's about everything that you're hearing amen and so I thank God for that because those that come on <clears throat> excuse me that come on amen are coming for the word and not for what they can see Amen. So I thank God for that. Go on today, Mother Taylor. Thank you. Amen for tuning in. Um, I, I just love you. I, I truly do with all of my heart. And I know that you love me. I feel that. And I know that you love the God that is in me as I love the God that is in you. God bless you. Go on today and be in peace. In Jesus' name, amen.